Uh, so, uh, good morning to everybody, and uh, we thank you for your availability to be uh, with us and to also the willingness to share uh, your uh, expertise and the life experience, so to speak, uh, on this uh, very important issue for us and for everybody, uh, that's the, the governance and the, 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 the deep sea and the marine environment, uh, mostly in the deep sea. Uh, as you know, we are uh, now uh, in a, some kind of informal meeting. Uh, we have called this the Science Policy Panel. It's organized by uh, our uh, department, the GRM, which is in charge of uh, a number of issues related to uh, marine issues. Uh, we have the marine transportation, we have harbors, we have um, uh, fisheries, and we have also uh, the duty and the, the legal competence to um, organize and to manage a um, uh, network of marine protected areas, mostly in the, the deep sea realm, in the, in the, the, the wide ocean. So, um, maybe, maybe uh, I do not want to, to make uh, long speeches. Uh, I would um, put the, uh, now uh, the, the word uh, to the uh, next person, and I would start maybe by Kate Larkin, ladies first. You are on my side, but if you want another, <laughs> I, I suggest that you go uh, like this, but if you want otherwise, please tell me. I'm not here as a uh, with a stick to, 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 to pick around. So, can you? Sure. Okay, good morning. Uh, so, my name is Kate Larkin, and I'm here representing the European Marine Board. Uh, that's a foresight network for marine science in Europe. So, we have 36 uh, member organisations, which range from marine research through to um, marine research funding organisations across Europe, across 19 countries, but we're very inclusive looking at the whole European seas and oceans, but in a, also with a global context to our activities. Um, so hopefully I can give some perspectives on the work that the, the European Marine Board and the marine science experts in Europe have um, provided for the role of science in um, deep sea ecosystem management. Um, we've published papers on, say, MPAs, looking at coherent networks of marine protected areas. We recently um, finalised a deep sea paper, which we're launching this evening as well. Um, and something I'd just um, kickstart the discussion is in terms of the role of science. Um, what we found throughout all our expert working groups is that science um, is needed and there's a demand for this basic research from all stakeholders right through the whole process of um, activities so whether you're designing managing or assessing a, a marine protected area or whether you're about to embark on industrial activity in the deep sea um, or you're at the exploitation phase of a commercial activity you will need um, basic research at some point and it's about this um, dialogue approach and making sure that the data are available and that both industry and science can identify the gaps that are needed um, for that science um, things like connectivity in the deep sea because we know so little about the ecosystem functioning um, but we don't know um, how um, heterogeneous all of the habitats are and whether um, we're protecting one area over another or whether an industry will be impacting um, a certain area whether that will um, have a wider impact or not all these things need to be uh, resolved and um, it's about yeah making the making this dialogue happen really um, so I think I'll just leave okay. it there for now and okay. then we'll see how the discussion goes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you Kate. Uh, I would like to, uh, if you agree with, um, if you can uh, put for the benefit of those that have not been uh, hearing our uh, talk yesterday, uh, what is the concept of uh, Euro European, uh, when I talk of the European Marine Board? I did ask you, remember, if yes. it was uh, European Union only? Uh, or if it was a wider concept, and uh, could you please, uh, for the benefit of those that did not attend or uh, get that, uh, uh, yeah, to explain sure. what's important. Yeah, so it's, it's a very inclusive interpretation of Europe, so the European Marine Board is working across all of European seas and basins. We do have a membership approach, so we have 36 members from 19 countries, but they're not just member states. So not just within the EU, we have Norway, we have mm -hmm. other associated countries, and all countries in Europe are welcome to join. Mm -hmm. It's just our membership is only 19 countries at this point. Okay, thank um, you very yeah. much. Uh, right, well, perhaps I should very quickly introduce myself first. Yes, uh, Monica Verbeek from uh, Seas at Risk. Seas at Risk is a uh, non-governmental organization. We are an umbrella organization of environmental organizations uh, 
uh, from all over Europe working on the conservation of the marine environment and on behalf of all our members also widely from Norway to Portugal, from Ireland to Croatia. Um, um, we are uh, involved with uh, government, with policy makers uh, to ensure that they take uh, the right decisions uh, for the marine environment. Um, not always very successful of course, but uh, that's uh, our role. So we are not government and we are not scientists, we are um, critical bystanders perhaps, mm. it's the best. Uh, um, and we see uh, uh, sometimes where there are uh, gaps and we try to bring that up into the political uh, agenda and make sure that it's being uh, addressed. Um, so when you're talking on my view on international organizations, you're referring to organizations like OSPAR for example. For example? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's this whole legal framework which is very complicated in the, in, in the case of Portugal because, because of your extended uh, uh, shelf, because you have parts where you have the jurisdiction only on the bottom, mm -hmm. and others where there's also the sea column, and then the EU comes in for, for things like fisheries, etc. So that's quite complicated. And then, of course, um, Portugal has proposed several MPAs uh, for... Uh, uh, as OSPAR uh, protected areas where, where OSPAR will have a, a remit and I think uh, um, especially um, in the context of, of usefulness of MPAs I think it's very important that you do have a, a regional uh, network of uh, MPAs and that OSPAR does have a sort of a coordinating role although at this moment um, OSPAR is not too uh, strong in that um, I, I do see a role for them to, to for OSPAR to play as, as um, it does make sense to uh, coordinate uh, um, um, conservation efforts uh, for MPAs uh, uh, that are, you know, uh, what's it called? Well, transgressing uh, uh, borders, so there are international uh, uh, MPAs that you make sure that all the uh, stakeholders uh, are in there and that all the uh, relevant uh, countries uh, are, are cooperating. Mm -hmm. Also making sure that, that, it is <coughs> that there will be truly a network of uh, MPAs in the OSPAR uh, area. Okay, thank you. Uh, I fully agree uh, with that view and I think it's not uh, just a matter of getting uh, the big brother up there, looking and organizing things. It is also a way of those organizations uh, getting further, uh, uh, widening their own uh, the, the, their own type of work <laughs> and uh, their uh, the, the, the sphere of uh, knowledge. Uh, because we have various, to, we must manage uh, under one clause uh, as a coastal state. Uh, if most, if part of this area is not within the OSPAR area, it is not a problem for the uh, coastal state. Uh, we can get the technical input from the OSPAR and from other organizations, but it should be a challenge for uh, OSPAR and other international organizations to take to take uh, notice uh, that they go uh, that the limits of their. Um, uh, involvement, uh, at least uh, scientific, technical, advisory involvement, exceeds their initial borders. So it's, it is something that can work both ways and probably should work both ways. Yeah. I think OSPAR has a very much a coordinating role, yeah. not, not a supervising role, and it, it's facilitating uh, yes. information exchange and ensuring that throughout the region mm -hmm. you have a representative uh, a network of, yeah. uh, of MPAs. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, we are going now into science, <laughs> well-established and time-honored science. So, please, Cindy. Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, I'm Cindy Vandover from Duke University, and I have been working in the deep sea as a scientist, um, gosh, since 1982 was my first crew. So, I'm a field-going scientist, um, mm -hmm. and my expertise is really in chemosynthetic ecosystems. Um, I think that the, the interesting thing about that's come up with marine spatial planning and from a scientific perspective is thinking about trying to understand and contribute to defining what the objectives of an MPA might be and then how the scientific community, how my science can contribute to mm -hmm. making sure the MPA is, is makes, makes sense. 
And so that means things, we've already mentioned the connectivity, the, the representativity, um, where, where, where it makes sense to put the MPAs and, and how do you assess how they might function. Mm -hmm. What's exciting to a scientist is not serving as a consultant, mm -hmm. but actually going out and asking questions, testing hypotheses. We don't, MPAs in the deep sea are, are new. We're mm -hmm. at a frontier, yeah. and it's a real opportunity for us to learn a lot about the ecosystems that we're interested in, um, and also serving the, the needs of the MPA design and assessment. Okay, thank you. And uh, also, it's a, a test to further our uh, borderline and between not, uh, what is known and what is Absolutely. not known. Yeah. And also, how we must uh, work in that context of uncertainty in order to uh, avoid big mistakes we can be uh, sorry about later. Right, yeah, so it's a lot about, you know, we, we like to say, oh, we just don't know enough, but mm -hmm. in fact, we do. And yes. you pointed this out, we do know some things and we can make some good guesses of mm -hmm. what's going to work, yeah. what might not work. But then it's it's still exploration, it's still ex exploring these mm -hmm. ideas of and and assessing mm -hmm. whether they mm -hmm. have worked. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to speak, we are not in darkness. There is lots of bioluminescence around <laughs> that comes from scientific knowledge already gathered, mm -hmm. uh, even if other people is not aware that right. the knowledge is there. And also, uh, we have uh, that wonderful thing about scientists. We can make uh, informed guesses about things. It's not a demonstrated truth, but it's, it's an informative uh, guess. Yeah. And we're curious. Yeah, yeah. OK, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Still on the field of uh, uh, art science and uh, time honored science, uh, please. Uh, my name is Sandra Brooke. I work for Florida State University now as a research faculty. Um, I did foray into the NGO world for a few years with the um, Marine Conservation and Biology Institute where I was working um, at, with policy and enforcement, which is another issue within MPAs. But going back to the science, um, the, the US was a few years behind Europe in sort of, I work mostly on deep sea corals, a little bit on chemosynthetic systems, but the US was a few years behind Europe in their sort of recognition of the importance of deep sea coral ecosystems and exploration and understanding where these things are. And so I've uh, worked in um, the southeastern US and the Gulf of Mexico and then um, most recently in the Middle Atlantic and exploring these deep sea habitats, defining where the corals are and what they are. And now we're sort of moving into rather where are they and what are they to how do they function. But um, uh, Dr. Van Dover was absolutely right. We do know enough to start drawing lines. If we wait until we have enough, then there's going to be nothing left. So I think we need to move forward with what we have. It's not perfect, but we have used scientific data in several regions within the US, where most of my experience is, to uh, establish deep water marine protected areas. And we have the advantage in some ways over places like Europe um, that have had deep sea fisheries for many years because in, in most of our regions we don't have established really deep sea fisheries. So we're getting ahead of that sort of curve in, in terms of being able to proactively protect areas rather than reactively um, protect, try and establish protection which comes into conflict with the fishing industry. And the other aspect of marine protected areas that I've worked on is, is law enforcement recognizing that it's really not enough to draw lines in the ocean, that we really actively need to enforce those those areas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like to stress uh, one point that you, you put forward about the establishment of uh, areas without having 100% uh, information on their value. It should be really like that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, when we compare the, the, the evolution of uh, scientific knowledge on both sides of the Atlantic at the same latitude, uh, we uh, must remember one thing in natural conservation where you have quite a lot of expertise and uh, 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 work done in the field. Uh, as I uh, see and as uh, we were taught, there are uh, two possibilities for considering nature. One was the traditional European way in small spaces based on feudal privileges uh, you have that uh, uh, in Robin Hood uh, saga, uh, something that was only for the, the big boss mm -hmm. with lots of people 
uh, making uh, uh, law enforcement with a uh, uh, very strong end uh, against trespassers. But people was out there, and all of them, in, they were suspects of trespassers. Uh, and then you have the American way, uh, with the, the, the parks, uh, a new nation, uh, with lots of technology, lots of greed uh, to make money fast, and, <laughs> and some, some uh, informed people at the cultural elite that was uh, aware of what was uh, at risk and took preventive measures in order to keep that for the future generations to see, to enjoy, and uh, it's another way. And I think uh, we must learn uh, quite a lot from that, what has been working and what has not been working with the, so to speak, American approach, mm -hmm. uh, without uh, forgetting also the uh, good things that we may have from the, so to speak, uh, European approach. Uh, thank you again. And now I will do something that I hate, that is uh, talk with a, a friend from my country uh, in, in a language that is not ours. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as you know, Portugal has uh, a, ter um, a territory that is spread. Uh, it's, uh, it's not separated by the ocean, by, uh, on the contrary, it is uh, connected by the ocean. It was across the ocean that we arrived, uh, our ancestors uh, were arrived on the Atlantic Islands that, that are now uh, part of uh, the Portuguese uh, nation. And uh, we have to uh, take uh, measures at several uh, levels. We have to make research at several levels. It would not be uh, good for anybody uh, that people from Lisbon would go out to the Azores to make the biological studies. Uh, the things are there and the scientists, even if they are not there, they must be made uh, available there and it has been happening for decades. And also on the other side, it would not make sense to study a small lizard in a mountain of mainland mm -hmm. Portugal to import scientists, let's say, from uh, Zorge or Madeira to go there uh, at co huge costs. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we must share and, uh, the, the, the possibilities, the knowledge, and the, uh, the, 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 the working uh, uh, means we have, uh, 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 ships, uh, materials, and so. Uh, and I know the Azores have come uh, a long uh, way on this, and uh, I would like to ask Guy uh, Menezes if he can uh, say something about the regional involvement on these issues and the international involvement associated to Okay, good morning. <coughs> My name is Guy Menezes. I work since 1995 uh, on deep sea biology, <coughs> mainly fishes and uh, also sea mounts ecology around the Azores and several uh, Atlantic islands. Uh, yes, the, the, um, I think the Azores, um, well, first the Azores uh, is, um, I would say, a, a complex region because we have a lot of very different types of eco deep sea ecosystems. We have either thermal vents, we have sea mounts, we have um, abyssal plants, we have trenches, we have a lot of different uh, habitats and ecosystems. Um, we have, um, uh, well, let's say, an, an artisanal fishery. We don't, we don't have uh, uh, trawl fisheries there. So um, the first thing I, I'd like to bring to this panel probably is that <coughs> management and conservation um, probably should be uh, adapted to, to, to its reality. It's we, we, can, we haven't a receipt for, for everything. Uh, <coughs> Azores, was, Azores and Portugal was a pioneer pioneers some years ago, for example, when um, they create the rainbow uh, uh, MPA uh, under the OSPAR. Uh, uh, and this was a very um, interesting uh, example because OS uh, rainbow is outside the jurisdiction, Portuguese jurisdiction. So this is a very interesting case. Um, ben and many times what I, I, I feel is that for the countries is easy to do or to impose something outside their jurisdiction than inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in Portugal and in the Azores, this is the same. Um, to, to make, uh, to, to, to do this kind of management and conservation, we need a lot of information. And um, 
we need also to, because the ways uh, to study the deep sea is very difficult, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 other thing that I would like to bring to this panel is we need cooperation. Mm -hmm. There's another idea that I would like to bring because there are a lot of things to, to know. Uh, for, um, it's good for scientists, uh, uh, but uh, probably for management, we must need uh, to know more, much more than we know uh, now. Um, we must share information, we must cooperate, um, and uh, all this to, to try to anticipate some impacts that we are uh, thinking that they will come in the future, like mining and things like that. This, is, uh, this could be a, a very huge impact on the deep sea, for example, this is one. Um, regarding the fisheries, uh, I think the fi deep sea fisheries now are more or less stable, let's say. Um, I don't think that we will discover in the next years much more fish, at least fishes, mm -hmm. uh, to, to able to be exploited. Uh, I think we are almost, we know very well now uh, what species there are down, down there, and also the technology, of course the technology, fishing technology uh, evolves a lot, it's very uh, technical, it's very precise, it's incredible, but um, is my opinion, I don't think we will have much more fish down there to, to be commercial, to be important for industry. Um, of course, we are still having problems, mainly in Europe and in other places, regarding the state of the stocks. Mm -hmm. Many stocks, most of them, the available data uh, does not allow to, to make the traditional analy analytical, uh, to use the traditional analytical models. So uh, most of the management, uh, let's say, is precautionary measures. Mm. Um, and um, I would like to bring also to this panel uh, an experience that we are making in the Azores. I think it's unique also. And it's being very, um, we are learn learning a lot, let's say, with that experiment. We close a fish, a, a seamount with the cooperation of fishermen, with the cooperation of um, local administration. And this is important, f why? Because we w would like to see how a seamount recover from a, a past of intensive exploitation. Because uh, I believe, and in science, this is what, uh, what is usual, we need to make experiments. Science needs experimentation to, to, to decide that in, in a way that we can understand exactly the phenomena, the processes. And um, we are making this, uh, the, uh, we are in the fifth year of experiment. We monitor all that amount every year. And one of the things we are noting as it is that um, each species uh, of fish, it's what I'm talking about now, uh, has um, their, own, um, their own life history. So they will react very different from each other. So another problem that that means we need to know a lot of connectivity. Uh, connectivity can be very important for one species, but less important for other species. What for species that reproduce in the, that particular seamount, uh, other species uh, come from outside. Uh, so um, this is a very complex situation, and to, and to manage all, all the things is, is difficult, but I think we will uh, find some, some ways. Um, so, well, I think I, uh, an another message, of course, is, is that uh, um, deep sea fisheries is, 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 uh, is, not, is almost not profitable. Um, and I think we must change also the, the paradigms of, of, the of, uh, of the exploitation of these species. In, in situations uh, like the Azores, I, I believe, for example, uh, is my opinion, I, I don't know if we will get there, but probably we will need to, to give concessions to fishing associations mm -hmm. for some places. Um, because uh, what we see now in most of everywhere is um, nowadays is not so like that, at, at least in, in Europe. And I think in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of restrictions and rules, mm -hmm. but uh, still the stocks still have problems. Uh, concessions uh, areas probably can be a, 
a way um, to exploit more rationally the, yeah. the, the fishing stocks. Okay, thank you.